Welcome to Fatima Today. I'm Carolyn Walsh, and I'll be your host. In 1917, the Blessed Mother appeared to three young children in the hills of Fatima, Portugal, and she taught them many things. One of the things that she really inspired in them was the desire to pray, and to pray without ceasing, to make up for their own sins and for the sins of mankind. She did this in such a beautiful way, and really their whole lives, two of them, Francisco and Jacinta, short lives, and Lucia, who lived for a very long time, lived their whole lives in prayer after these messages from Our Lady. We try to bring you guests who can share with you their lives and how they relate to Fatima. And today we have a wonderful guest, Frank Kelly, who's joining us. Thank you, Frank, for being with us. Thanks. Nice to have me, Carol. And he, uh, Frank, you certainly are a person who lives a life in constant prayer. Your whole life is a prayer. Seems to be. Mm-hmm. Anyway, well, so, but you didn't, you didn't uh, just start that way. I mean, certainly, you, from what I understand, you had uh, a strong faith all along. But you had a remarkable occurrence happen in your life over two decades ago. So I would love you to share with our guests um, your story. Tell us how you got to where you are today. Well, first of all, I'd like to share with you is important thing is prayer. But what prayer means is prayer means God instructing the individual, if we truly pray from our heart. As a young child, I was fortunate being one of 12 children. My mother brought us up in the rosary. We had the late Richard Cardinal Cushing at the time. We used to be on the radio every evening. Right. We came together as a family, and we prayed the rosary. And like most children, when we came in from the outside, you know, you, you really didn't want to do it in a sense, but just because it was on the radio and mom brought us in, and he had a deep Irish raspberry voice, and it went like, in the name of the <laughs> Father. <laughs> so you can imagine with 12 children, and then all of a sudden, each of us had at least three or four friends. You're up to 60 children wow. in a cold water flat. Wow. But we learned so much from Mom in this sense that she always said that, again, as I said earlier, prayer was God instructing you. And she used to relate to us about saints after the rosary and say, those are our true heroes. Wow. If you ever need to look at a, a to have a relationship, have a relationship with the saints so that you've come to get to know Mary, our mother, more for her to her son, and the son to lead us to the Father. Right. The Father is very important to us. So that the Father will give us a greater outpour in the Holy Spirit. And it was Mary who knew the Holy Spirit firsthand because mm -hmm. it came upon her completely. Yeah. So that's why she shares it, and that's how she started the church. Started the church in the upper room with all the apostles. So it Prayer being so important in my life, I always did every day. I used to pray to Rosie every day. I went to Mass when I could go to Mass. You know, when you eventually I got married and had children and everything, you didn't get the chance to do it every day. But I did as much as I could. But I always would say my Rosary. That meant so much to me, going to work every morning, coming home from work, I would say my Rosary. Frank, I want to ask you, <coughs> um, you, you mentioned that as a child you're coming in from playing. Sometimes as parents of young children, it's, it's really hard to just gather them all in. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of fighting, a lot of eye rolling and sighs. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're being interrupted in their playtime. Right. But what I'm hearing you say, what I'm encouraged by, is that that really gave you a foundation. As, as hard as it may have been for your mother, here you are today with that foundation. True. And it, but see, another thing, too, is... You know, I, I always said mom had the break of being having 12 children because when we came in, the whole baseball team came in with it, so right. everybody right. had to come along with you. So maybe that was an advantage to it, I don't right. know. But again, as I said to you, it meant so much. It, it really was something that you carried with you. You knew you had some kind of foundation, you had a good root. Yeah. You knew there was someone that was going to listen to you. Yeah. That's, how, that's how it seemed to be in my life. And, well, I'm going to go into it a little bit here, is my book. There's a book called Short Circuit to God that was written about me. The book came about because I do healing services. That's what I do do. And I go out and do seminars, Life and Spirit seminars, and do confirmation programs. And when I was going to different parishes, my spiritual director was Father Ron Ticelli. He's a doctor of philosophy at Boston College. Finally said he got so much request and asking who was this gentleman that just ran to our parish that this book was written and that's what it was written for. So in Short Circuit to God, mm -hmm. it's, it, it really um, outlines this great transformation or you being jettisoned in your prayer life and in your spiritual life. 
And it's a really peculiar story in that this doesn't happen to most people, and you really miraculously survived a mm. horrific event. Correct. It was, well, what I was in 1985, I was electrocuted. I had the entire electricity from the New England Medical Center come through my entire body, went through my right wrists, came through my hips, my calves, my feet, arced off, hit the seal, and came back through again. I always love to tell people to, to get an increase of prayer. Th the gift of piety is one who gets illuminated, <laughs> so I guess I was illuminated. God wanted to have a little more prayer out of me, I think. But nobody should try that at home. No, 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 no don't not, grab I'm any live wires. I'm right, not right. encouraging anybody <laughs> to do that. But the, the thing was that I did, of course, I passed out. I didn't know what happened when I hit the electric electrical wiring, see, because what happened was the electrician had pu pulled his wires to a junction box, and he twisted them together just like you put a twist on the end of the bread, the wires, and my right wrist, when it hit it, it pulled me up, but I didn't grab it. If I grabbed it, I obviously wouldn't be here today, but I leaned into it enough that that's what happened. It, it drew me up like a magnet. Wow. So eventually, I, my dead weight was able to fall away from it because of my own weight, thanks to, obviously, it's what God was doing, I, that's the way I had to look at it. I didn't go looking for this. Right. But they drew me out, and what happened was they brought me into the hospital. They originally wanted to send me to the Boston Medical because of the trauma unit there is one of the best in the world. And the, the gentleman who was the second command to me said, that's crazy because he's already in the hospital, run him in here. And the fairness to doctors, when they saw the word electrocution, they ex immediately assumed you'd be dead. Right. But when I brought, m brought my body in, my body temperature reached beyond a normal temperature, but I was still breathing, which they couldn't understand it. So they eventually put me into intensive care, and what they wanted to do was put me on ice. See, maybe to bring the temperature down, but the brass got together and said, well, if we do that, he might go into another shock and that will kill him. So why don't we just leave him there to die? He said he should go any minute anyway. And an intern came up with my death certificate, sat there in a chair, and expected me to go any minute. And for those that don't know, every now and then a dead body will shake or it'll pop up. Mm -hmm. And its reason is because you still have a little electricity left in your heart. And that's what makes you, you know, to react like that. Well, that's what I did. I popped right up. And he pushed me down, went to sign my death certificate, and I said I had to go to the bathroom. <laughs> so you can imagine what went yeah, through his sure. mind. Of course, he ran backpedal to the door and s said to me again, he said, what did you say? I said, I have to go to the bathroom. He said, I'll be right back. Because see, obviously he thought he was going to have an early evening and go home. The brain trust came in and the first question they said to me was this. They said, Cal, because they knew me, I worked there for seven years as a foreman. So all the department heads knew me. And he greeted me at this day. He said, Cal, you're better off dead. Now, what a way to be greeted. But right. to the science world, that would have made sense because two and two was four. But now it wasn't four anymore. They didn't understand this. So eventually what I had to do is I had to go through a whole process of being checked out completely in the intensive care. And they came down with they saying my heart was stopping. And I said, oh. And they said, you need a pacemaker. And I said, a what? <laughs> he said, a pacemaker. And I said, oh. I thought that was like a wristwatch you put on your wrist and snap it and then you could go walking right out of the hospital. I thought that we were that head with the computer game. But he said, no, it's going to take a whole operation and of course they describe it to you, how you need wires and everything. That's when fear came over me. Because see, to explain to most people, especially if nurses and doctors out there, if you showed me a needle, I would faint. Yeah. Immediately would faint. I yeah. just couldn't. Lots of people are like that. Oh yeah, and yeah. I, I, even if you took blood out of me as I was sitting down, I would fake sitting down, laying down, standing up, it didn't make any difference. And definitely didn't, never had an operation up to that point. Now prior to that, I fell 70 feet, I was hit by an automobile, dragged over 250 feet. I had a whole other thing happen to me and I never had a stitch to my body, which is amazing how which God... Which really that. clarifies for us that God has a mission for you. <laughs> yeah. Right? I have, well, a very strong angel too. Yeah, he's not letting <laughs> I thank God for his gift of my own angel to me. And but the thing was, it, to see, and he saw the fear that I had. He went and he got the anesthesiologist, and he came down, and he described to me the medication he'd give me that would do the operation, and it could be completely over, and you won't feel a thing. All I didn't believe him when they left the room. I went to the rosary that I've always done, 
and I started to pray, and I asked for the intercession of Padre Pio. See, as a young child, my mother started to teach us about Padre Pio. And one of the gifts he had was this gift of bilocation. Right. And I always said, well, God, if you permit it, he can come and see me, whether he's here in this world or in the next. And I prayed to his intercession. I said, please, Padre Pio, I've always prayed to you for many things. Help me at this moment. And sure enough, Padre Pio walked right into my room. It's clear as I'm looking at you, Carol. Wow. And he said, what else would Jesus say to you in a sense of this way? Be at peace. Everything would be fine. An hour of peace came over me. I know no man could ever give me. Yeah. You could have given me an autopsy right then and there. I, you could have had my arms, legs. You wouldn't even give me an overcan. It wouldn't have, you know, I, I would have completely done anything you wanted me to do. But I went to the operation, completed it. At the end of the operation, the doctor said to the intern, he said, listen, I've got to leave. I said, I want you to finish him up and stitch him up. So he did all that, and I came out of the hospital. I was fine with the operation. But the doctor came back on it Wednesday. And he came in, he says, Cal, how you feel? And I says, fine, terrific. And by the way, I said, well, how was your trip to Miami? That's when he almost collapsed. <laughs> he grabbed the clipboard at the end of my bed, and there was a wonderful girl by the name of Carol Kelly who was on the floor, who I knew her, but she didn't know. She, I mean, we knew each other, but she didn't know what was going on. And he said, look at the clipboard. And sure enough, brought in the whole part of saying that, you know, reading it, saw what the anesthesiologist did, she said, go get him. Wow. And he came down, just to be as briefly as possible, and it is, he said to me, he said, well, I gave him all this medicine and everything, and in this process, I said, did the intern do a good job stitching me up? So he knew that I shouldn't have been awake, right. he didn't know how this happened. But I mean, jumped up quickly, because you can read it all in the book, Shot Circuit to God. Yeah, and it's, I, I think... Um, there's so many details in there that we would mm -hmm. love to be able to cover. Mm -hmm. I, I want to talk about Padre Peel just briefly because mm -hmm. we hear we are hearing more and more stories of people who are being healed through his intercession, mm -hmm. through their faithful prayer to him, and him just making himself known and present. Mm -hmm. um, he is such a wonderful spiritual father for so many of us, and he promised um, his faithful children that he would not enter heaven until his last child has entered. Oh, I which believe is that. <laughs> such a beautiful story, and, right. and we can rest assured that he is here advocating for us and trying to bring us closer, mm -hmm. closer to our Lord. Frank, your life got a bit tumultuous. You, you went through a um, uh, separation from your wife. Mm -hmm. You were separated from your daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, you, and then you, you lived with your son, mm -hmm. who um, you raised. Mm -hmm. And the whole time, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, mm -hmm. but the whole time, you're, you're, it's almost, uh, as I'm reading your story, it's almost as if you have this feverish desire to just pray more and more and just be with our Lord as closely and intimately as you possibly can. Mm -hmm. uh, well, after the electrocution and everything like that, it came forward that the first thing I started to do was adoration. And I couldn't stop saying, I couldn't stop praying. And I'm going to use the words of St. Paul, we can pray unceasingly. Right. We say to yourself, you can't do that. But, you know, nothing's impossible with God. I believe God knew the intentions in my heart all the time to pray as much as possible. I even prayed that I would never lay anybody off. In seven and a half years as a foreman, I never laid anybody off. And I knew that had to do with prayer. At the foot of that church of St. James the Greater Church, mm. people didn't know he was a patron saint, a construction worker. Wow. Well, the Lord started teaching me in this way more in-depth about the saints to use them in many different ways to help us because he wants them to be known also. And we seem to throw them aside. As Catholics, they're a tremendous gift right. from God, but they also help you. I ended up doing adoration as much as 10, 11 hours a day, rosaries. I would do the Stations of the Cross. I did many n different novenas, and all these novenas as a child that I came back to, too, they had a lot to do with it that St. Francis Xavier right. was very important in my life that as a young child, that that's part of my ministry today because I help free from India. All the proceeds from the book goes to India and it goes to Ghana. So the missionary work is still being done the way God wants it done, not the way Frank wants it done. Right. And I pray to God that it's always going to be God's way. And it was a gift. So w the Lord said to me one day, he said, Frank, this is going to stop. And I said, no, I love, I love that oration. 
was like being at home and a good parent holding you and yeah. just being right along with you. He said, no, this is going to be ending. Well, eventually I was left to a wonderful priest by the name of Father Robert DeGrandis. And he was the one that fulfilled what God wants, I believe, in my life. I have a beautiful spiritual director who I've been connected to for 17 years. Our own bishop, Cardinal Sean O'Malley, has given me a letter to travel anywhere in the country and anywhere to do a healing service. And the beautiful part was when I first met him, he said to me, he said, you know, Frank, you know what you are? He says, you're a true blue Roman Catholic and you're constipated and we're about to get it out of you. <laughs> this is well, Father de Grandis who said this This is Father de Grandis who was the one who showed me that. And I'm jumping up there. You can read the rest of that part of the story in yeah. that. And what, as soon as he said it, I knew it. I knew there was something that God was going to do. And then he said to me, I want you to pray with this woman. And that's one thing I always never wanted to do. I said, no, that's left to Padre Pio, or left to priest, left to the religious life. But eventually I prayed with this woman, and we prayed, and Father stopped and said amen, and I said amen. And then he walked away from me and came back, and he said this, do you want to tell her what you saw? And I told the woman, basically, I saw the word boat. And she leaped out of the chair. She says, I don't know you. I don't know how you know about my boat and what's this problem. And <laughs> what she was doing was she was praying that her husband doesn't buy this boat. And at the same time, her husband was saving up money to buy a boat. Well, everybody went on a coffee break. They came back into the classroom with her husband. And there was just the woman and myself in the classroom. And her husband said to his wife, he said, darling, you know that boat I always wanted to buy? I've lost all interest in buying <laughs> any boats. She got all excited again, jumped up and down. It just his father walked in. And then he said this. He said, Frank, please, God has brought you here, even though I didn't want to come. And he said, I ask you to pray for two things. I want you to pray for a good spiritual director and always be obedient to the majesty of the church. I've been doing this now for 20 years almost, and I've always tried to be obedient to the majesty of the church and obedient to my bishops, and especially my spiritual director. You know, one thing <coughs> that you just said that, that resonates I think with many of us is uh, you were in that place it, sort of against your own will. Yeah. You, you went, you didn't want to go. There's lots of things that we have to do as Catholics that we don't want okay. to be doing. They don't yeah. necessarily satisfy us, mm -hmm. but doing God's work and doing His will uh, takes courage. Right. But I think it's a lot has to do with our prayer again. Yes. When we're praying, we if we ever ask God, say, Father, how should I pray? Yeah. Most of us have a tendency not to speak to God the Father. You know, we get, we come to know Mary, and we come to know Jesus, and we come to even know a little bit about the Holy Spirit, but we're forgetting the Father. And the Father is the director of everything here. Yeah. See? I mean, it, it, no matter what is going on, it, it, God is the Father is the one that Jesus himself said, I am in this world to give glory to my Father. Right. When I met Father Toselli for the first time, I kept saying to him, Father, I, I don't know what's going on in my life. I just know I needed some help here. And we, I went in Psalm at 9.30 and 1. I didn't leave till 10.30 at night. See, so you can imagine what was that was going on. And I know he's looking at me like, you know, okay, let's see. But he said this to me. He said, Frank, from the minute that you come in to the minute you left, you kept saying, I want to give glory to God the Father. And he said, for your information, that is the model of St. Ignatius. Wow. And he, Father is a Jesuit. Right. So he was able to connect. So I always thought of that word as when Jesus stood before John the Baptist and he said, I can't baptize you. I can't even tie your sandals. He said, yeah, I know, but come on, get up. <laughs> now baptize me because we're going to give glory to my Father. So if, my f if the Father had already told the Son, so I got to look to the Father, to the Son. I have to go to the Son and say, Father, to your Son, help me. Show me my prayer. Show me how you want me to pray. Right. What do you want me to do? And the biggest thing comes down to is the most difficult things for us in the church is to try to obey the Beatitudes. Mm. It's very difficult to say, I want to love my enemy. Right. Do good to those who persecute me. It's very, very difficult. But you know, I say to husbands, wife, children, everything, if, we could, if a husband and wife could start every day off with a simple prayer like, come on and carol, me playing as your husband say, please forgive me, I'm not the husband you want me to be. Yeah. You'd be running around right away saying, oh, what did he do wrong? 
when he's trying to say something from his heart right. to say, I want to start the day off right. right. And the wife doing the same, please let me forgive me, right. not the wife you want me to be. Right. The husband be running around with the credit cards. He must want to do something <laughs> foolish, you know. But no, it isn't that. It's the matter of being free. Yeah. Jesus came to set us free. Right. But he also taught us how to do it. Right. Have we looked to him from the Father to see how to do it? Right. So that's how my prayer life started. Uh, I have a very strong prayer life in the sense of this way. It, I pray to many saints, things that, and I let God do it. So little by little, I was getting these saints' names to pray to. I had no idea why, and then later on, most of the time when I do pray with people, I give them a saint to pray to. And they are the church triumphant. Sure. I mean, they, they are, yeah, those the, of they're us. In, they're right before the beat that's of right. the so, of God. So we really, I mean, think about mm -hmm. what, what a tremendous gift that is, that we yeah. can call upon them and upon mm -hmm. their intercession. Because right. they want us to be up there with them. So Correct. So keep our eyes on eternal salvation. And I, well, it, it, it's funny. It's, I prayed to St. Jerome one time, just to give you one little example. Of prayer, this woman had called me up and that uh, trying to get my children into a Catholic school and the school had already started. And I said, well, pray to St. Jerome, that's what I got. And an elderly lady called later on in the day and said, you know, I prayed to her, I said, oh, pray to St. Jerome. I said, you got something wrong with children or something? She says, oh, no, no, I'm trying to get my two grandchildren in this Catholic daycare thing and, you know, so they can learn about Jesus because, <laughs> you know, her children weren't going and whatever. And so I said, oh, pray to St. Jerome. And I never forgot that I told them to pray for four days at the time, and sure enough, at the end of the four days, they both called me. The young lady called and said, listen, she said, I got not one child, but I got all four children into the school. Wow. And then later on, the elderly lady called and said, I got my two grandchildren into school. Right. So I happened to go to Mass at night that night, not realizing it, when I got to Mass, started now praying, thanking St. Jerome for in interceding for these people here. And when the priest came out and he says, we have a wonderful feast day today. He says, today's the feast of St. Jerome. Oh, wow. So see, God yeah. wasn't it. But see, the yeah. point was this, that St. Jerome got recognized right. in a sense of saying he completed a mission. So he's the patron saint of teachers. Right. So I tell teachers, look towards him. Right. Look, ask for his help so things will be done properly. Right. That's no coincidence. No. That's what God wanted to do. Um, that is just an excellent uh, thing for all of us to hear. One thing I wanted to um, recommend, too, is just everybody trying to do a morning offering, starting your day off. You know, as, as wives, as mothers, as husbands, as students, whatever role we're in, our lives get very, very busy. Mm -hmm. And as hard as we try throughout the day to... to call upon God, if we offer him our day right at the very beginning, our whole mm. day is really a prayer. You know, that is a gift, actually. It's called the gift of fear of the Lord. If we take everything that we do, like the little flower it's at St. Teresa, and that's what I do. I have rheumatoid arthritis, so it's not easy for me to get dressed and everything, things like that in the morning. So every little pain in what I have, I turn around and say, okay, Lord, I do this to give you glory. And as the more you're doing that, what are you getting? Great wisdom from it. Right. You can look to people like St. Leopold. You can look to people like old father Casey Solanus. You can look to Padre Pio who lived with a stigma and right. people think, you know, think of all the pains that these people went through. Right. There wasn't a saint that didn't have something wrong with them. <laughs> and can it make us uh, embrace our crosses and unite uh, those little sufferings, little and big? I mean, some of us have bigger crosses than others, but we can mm -hmm. unite them mm -hmm. with Christ and joyfully accept them. To finish it, I'd like to say it in this one here. You know, recently a bishop was in a consecration camp in China, and he came out, and the priest was introduced to him and said to him, how old are you? He says, he's, you know, he's 86 years old. He said, well, you only look about 60. He said, well, it's true, he said, but I took 21 years of my life and gave it to God, so he gave me 21 years back. So he'll probably live longer. And I always tell people, if we take our own pains and our suffering, we give them to God. Let God do what he wants to do with that. Right. Don't you think he's not going to restore right. something back to our life right. that we can give him glory in the way he has to do right. so? Frank, you've um, certainly been a tremendous example to a lot of people in our area. And I know that you've traveled throughout the country as well, mm -hmm. conducting healing services and providing uh, lots of comfort and mm -hmm. solace to people and bringing people closer to God and, and introducing them to the saints. 
which has been a really uh, wonderful gift that we've been able to access. Mm -hmm. Just like Our Lady of Fatima said, you know, offer up. I, she asked the children, are you willing to accept the sufferings that God has for you and offer them up in reparation for your own sins and the sins of mankind? And you've been able to lead many of us in that direction, which has been a really beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. um, can you leave us with one, one last word or words of wisdom? Sure, I look at it in this way. You know, if you look at the rosary, the rosary is like reading the scriptures. You pray them, you meditate them. What more than to understand the scriptures? Originally, that's how they understood the scripture was just through the Our Father. Right. They had to learn the Our Father up the hill and down the hill they yeah. came. And if we look to Mary, the Queen of Wisdom, she's a true mother. Read the scriptures when you can, along with doing the scriptures by saying the rosary. And that reminds our viewers to pray the rosary every day and to wear your scapular. It's a protection, and she will protect you with her mantle. Frank, thank you for joining us. Thank, thank you, you for joining us. See you again next week at the same time. Our Lady at Fatima said, Pray, pray a great deal, and make sacrifices for sinners. For many souls go to hell because they have no one to pray and make sacrifices for them. Our Lady of Fatima said, I have come to ask the faithful to amend their lives and ask pardon for their sins. They must cease offending God, who is already too much offended.